Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog, also GamblersAdvisory.com. Today is Sunday, March 27th, 2022. Let's talk about a very rare occurrence, very rare occurrence on Dateline. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, the current Dateline is fascinating. It explores the murder of Lee Radder. And on the show, one of my heroes, Keith Morrison, sits down with the man who was convicted of killing Mr. Ratter, Robert Fisher. And in my opinion, Keith Morrison, and this rarely happens, gets duped by a charismatic killer. Right, Fisher has an explanation for everything. The way the show is edited, you get the feeling that this was a close call, right? The defense theory is that the murder victim committed suicide, killed himself by shooting himself in the right eye with a gun that belonged to the defendant, Robert Fisher. That's the defense version. The prosecution's version is different, as you could imagine. They claim that Robert Fisher has been lying all along and that he killed Mr. Ratter, who happened to be his son-in-law. Let's go through the evidence. Here's my take. And please, this is just my opinion. I'm not making a statement of fact here. Right? In my opinion, Mr. Fisher is a charismatic killer. When he sits down with Dateline, he's very smooth. I also believe he did the crime. I believe the jury got it right. Right? He's out now. Because, of course, there was a motion for new trial that got granted, and then the appellate court said, no, 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 you've got to be kidding. Uh, this isn't right. They threw out the granting of the motion for new trial. Then COVID hit. Then there were delays. Now, of course, the prosecution is deciding not to pursue the case. So let's be clear here. In my opinion, based on what we're about to discuss, Robert Fisher got away with murder. Now let's talk about it. They tell you a lot of facts that have some relevance, others that don't have any. Now I believe it's very relevant that Mr. Fisher used to be a police officer. Right? Policemen know how to deal with other cops. They know what the cops responding to the scene of the crime are looking for. They also understand the evidentiary value of gunpowder residue, of the need not to have an accused wash their hands after a murder involving a firearm. They also know, too, about the forensic evidence, right? The importance at a murder scene of figuring out how the evidence shows the sequence of the crime took place. So they're looking for things like bloody footprints. When they find the victim, there's a big question. Is this where the victim was killed? Or has the body been moved? I believe that the defendant's experience as a police officer in the past played a role here. The defendant 
left the police force to become a family lawyer. Full disclosure, I myself am a divorce lawyer. I'm not sure if that is as relevant. I believe that's dangled out there to try to convince people that, oh, this defendant is a good guy, right? Look, he's a lawyer. He has to follow state bar rules. How could a lawyer be a killer? Right, folks? It happens. In fact, I believe it happened in this case. In late December of 2010, the defendant visits his stepdaughter, Belinda, who's married to Mr. Ratter, who is almost the same age as the defendant, Mr. Fisher. Now, Belinda goes to bed about 11.30 p.m. Everyone's been drinking heavily. So father-in-law, of course, is sitting there with son-in-law. They're the two left up. And, of course, they're drinking and talking. Now, understand a few facts. Son-in-law has had some financial difficulty. It's been feast or famine for son-in-law, financially. Now, if you've been in a family where people have concerns for, let's say, a daughter or daughter-in-law who's married to a guy who isn't quite working a nine-to-five, views himself as an entrepreneur, but it's been hit or miss, mostly miss, then I could see there being some strain. I could see a father-in-law saying to son-in-law, hey, son, why don't you get a job at the post office? Right? I could see a son-in-law, you know, asking father-in-law for money, and let's say the conversation doesn't go smoothly. Well, here's what we know. Son-in-law, the victim. Son-in-law is having some financial problems. He's hoping for a big business deal. He gets a phone call. This is what we're supposed to believe concerning the business deal. The business deal hasn't quite gone as expected. Son-in-law is not going to make the money he was hoping to make. He hangs up the phone. The two guys, of course, are then there late at night drinking shortly after the phone call. Now, at about 5 a.m., here's what we know happens next. Defendant makes a call to the police because son-in-law is lying on the floor, shot in the eye. When the police arrive, Father-in-law, Mr. Fisher, is kneeling over son-in-law, who, of course, is bleeding to death. So the defense wants you to believe that son-in-law killed himself. That this was that one miss, that one failed business deal too many. And that son-in-law, having financial difficulties, decided, that's it, I need a way out, let me shoot myself. Here's the catch. We know son-in-law hated guns. We know son-in-law did not have a gun. The gun he shoots himself with mysteriously was the defendant's gun. When the cops arrive, the defendant, and we'll get back to this, tells the cops that he was sleeping in a bedroom and that he came out and saw son-in-law bleeding from a gunshot wound on the floor and then realized that the gun used was his gun, which he had earlier disassembled because since he was visiting his daughter-in-law and her kids, he didn't want any of the kids 
finding the gun and hurting themselves. Sounds good on TV. Right, Robert Fisher comes across as empathetic. I believe there's a backstory here. I believe the evidence does not support the defense's contention that son-in-law Lee Ratter killed himself. It just doesn't work. So let's talk about the evidence. The defense points out that Mr. Fisher's DNA is not on the gun. Right? The idea is, hey, how could I have killed son-in-law if my DNA is not on the gun? The gun, by the way, is found in son-in-law's right hand. His thumb is by the trigger. Now, if you believe the defense, well, that's where the gun was. If you believe the prosecution, the gun may have been planted. Well, just understand. As the appellate court pointed out in reversing the granted motion for new trial, no evidence was presented at trial, none whatsoever, to show that DNA necessarily is transferred by touch to a firearm. Right? The absence of Defendant's DNA doesn't mean that defendant didn't touch the gun. Right? Also understand, too, that it's defendant who made the 911 call. We don't exactly know when Mr. Ratter was killed. It's possible that defendant may have had time to wipe the gun. Defendant then could have had enough time to put the gun in the victim's hand. The prosecution believes the scene was staged. But let's dig a little deeper here. Isn't the defense here somewhat ridiculous because defendant openly admits that it was his gun right of course defendant's dna which here is not on the gun which to me is curious had it been on the gun defendant would have been able to argue well it's my gun i brought it to my daughter-in-law's house which by itself in my opinion is curious Right, But he's going to say, hey, I brought it to my daughter's uh, house. Then I thought about the kids and I disassembled the gun. So since defendant himself admits that he had the gun, was actually touching several parts of the gun and disassembling it, isn't the argument here that there's none of his DNA on the gun? Curious. In any event, there's no evidentiary foundation laid by any expert witness that if he touched the gun as part of a staging, his DNA necessarily would have been transferred to the gun. Now, let's talk about non-blood and blood DNA. This is a major point here. The victim's DNA is on the gun, but it's bloody. In other words, it's consistent with the victim already getting shot, already having blood on his hands, right? Let's remember, it's a head wound, right? Your head has a lot of blood in it. The victim is shot in the right eye. So it's a bloody crime scene. So as you can imagine, 
after the victim is shot. Not before, but after the victim is shot. There's going to be blood, DNA, all over the place. So the question is, what type of DNA is on the gun? Is it the victim's non-blood DNA, which would indicate that the victim is holding the gun before the blood starts flowing? In other words, before he's shot, which would be consistent with suicide. Is non-blood DNA on the gun or is blood DNA on the gun? Because if the victim's DNA on the gun is all blood DNA, then that DNA got there after the victim got shot and was bleeding. Well, just understand that no expert testified that the victim's non-blood DNA was on the gun. The opposite is true. The victim's blood DNA is on the gun. In other words, the victim's DNA gets on the gun after the victim starts bleeding. Not before. So, understand the state's DNA expert testified that because the blood was the source of the DNA, it was not surprising to find the victim's DNA on the gun. It's consistent with the gun being placed in his hand after the victim was already shot. Let's go one step further. The fingerprints on the gun. Are there dry fingerprints from the victim on the gun? Right, which would indicate that the victim again held the gun before he was shot. Or are all the prints on the gun bloody fingerprints? Which would show that the victim, who again shoots himself in the eye, Right, so he's bad off immediately. If all the fingerprints on the gun are bloody fingerprints, that would indicate that the victim was bleeding when his hands touched the gun. The victim was already shot. Well, understand, folks, that the fingerprint they find on the gun is a bloody print. It's consistent with somebody placing the gun in the victim's hand after the victim was already shot. Let's also talk about something more foundational here. You know, you shoot a gun, things move, as you can imagine. The gun has a little bit of a backlash on it, a kick. So you would expect, if you hold a gun and you fire it, especially if you have no experience shooting guns, which apparently the victim had no experience shooting guns. If you shoot a gun, the prints should be smudged, not pristine. Smudged. Would it shock you that not only is the fingerprint on the gun a bloody print, but it's not smudged, right? I believe that's a mistake that the defendant made here, since I believe the defendant did the crime. Again, just my own opinion, right? When he places the gun in the victim's hand, he should have moved the gun around a little bit as the gun would move around, had the victim fired the gun. This way, the prints would have been smudged. Don't get me wrong, he'd still have a problem, because there's another oversight, with the fact that the print is a bloody print. But folks, here, you have an unsmudged bloody print. 
So the fact that it's bloody means that the victim's already bleeding when the gun's in his hand. The fact that it's unsmudged shows that the gun did not move when it was in the victim's hand. I would argue that the gun's placed there after the victim was shot. That's why the print is a bloody print, and that's why the print is pristine. Let's continue. You know, it's fascinating that the gun belongs to the defendant, not the victim. It's even more fascinating that there is no evidence that the victim knew the gun was in the house, knew where the gun was, right? After all, the defendant was a visitor to the victim's house. The defendant brought the gun with him. So if the victim decided to kill himself, he wouldn't know there was a gun in the house. And worse yet, if he found the gun, understand he would only find a dissembled gun. Because the defendant here claims he took the gun apart at the house to make sure the kids couldn't use it. Now let's ask an awfully dumb question here. How would a guy who doesn't know guns, who hates guns, know how to assemble the gun? Think about it. Right? The victim would have to first decide to kill himself. Then the victim, after finding the gun, would have to know how to put the gun together. Folks, this is inconsistent with everything the defendants told us. The defendant has told us that they were drinking heavily, that the defendant may have blacked out, that he has memory gaps on what happened. Now, if he's drinking with the victim, if the victim is drinking and is drunk, even if the victim were to find the dissembled firearm, how would he figure out how to put that dissembled firearm together? Keep in mind, it's dissembled in a way where the gun owner, the defendant, was convinced the kids couldn't figure out how to put the gun together. So ask yourself, what's more likely? The son-in-law, who, by the way, has had financial problems before, Right? I would argue that the person who's had financial problems in the past and has bounced back is not going to be suicidal over the latest missed business deal. Right? There have been other missed business deals. He's an entrepreneur, not a nine-to-fiver. He understands that it's feast or famine, that some business deals are not going to happen. Now, is it realistic that that guy the entrepreneur, the boom and bust entrepreneur who's experienced it all is going to decide to kill himself. And then in a drunk stupor, let's say he finds the gun and says, oh, let me use the gun, is going to be able to put the gun together so that he could kill himself. Is that more likely or less likely than him being killed by the gun owner, who knows how to assemble the gun, who knows where he put the gun, who, for crying out loud, brought the gun with him to the victim's house. Well, let's go further. When the cops arrive and they're talking with the gun-owning defendant, the gun that was used in the murder, right? The defendant, of course, is claiming, hey, I, 
I don't know what happened. I wasn't in the room. Right? I was I was someplace else. I was in another room. I found the body. I don't know how this happened. Well, would it shock you to find out that there was a particle, not much, but a particle of gunpowder residue on defendant's shirt? Folks, if you're in the other room, how does the gunpowder end up on your shirt? Keep in mind, too, this is a former cop. He would know how to create a barrier so the gunpowder residue doesn't hit him. But even here, there's gunpowder residue on the defendant's shirt. So the defendant wasn't in some other room. The defendant is in the same room with the murder victim when the murder victim gets shot. Understand too, and this is interesting, there's no gunpowder residue on the victim which would indicate that the victim didn't fire the gun. Also, you're a former cop. You understand the importance of the statements you make to the police. You understand the nature of the police's role here. They show up, they're investigating. They're asking you questions to further their investigation. Their goal is to get at the truth, right? So you understand when the police come and they're asking you questions, it is important for you to give them accurate, truthful information, right? You don't want to say things off the cuff that might be true or that might not be true. If you don't remember something or you don't know something, Right? If this defendant woke up, blacked out, woke up, didn't know what happened, and then saw his son-in-law dead next to him, well, that's what the guy should tell the police. When the police say, where were you? The answer would be, you know, I was blacked out here. Or, I don't remember. Right? The first thing I recall is seeing this guy on the floor. There's a gap in my memory. That's what the defendant, if that's what happened, should have told the police. That's not what he told the police. Rather, the former cop repeatedly tells police that he was sleeping in the guest bedroom. Right, folks, the statement isn't true, right? The blood spatter evidence indicates, this is in addition to the gunpowder residue, that the defendant was sitting next to the victim when the victim was shot. He wasn't in the next room. Right, understand. This evidence is so overwhelming that the defendant's own lawyer had to admit in his closing statement that the defendant was next to the victim when the victim got shot. Now, folks, that's a red flag here. You need to underline that part of the case. Why was the defendant lying to the cops? He himself is a former cop. He knows how important his statements are. 
Why would he, and the lies a whopper, why would he put himself in another room when he was in the same room as the murder victim when the murder victim got shot? Why would he do that? Well, let's talk about another problem. So he's in the room with the murder victim. Now, let's remember, he calls 911. If any group in the world would understand that in a shooting death, an accused should not wash their hands before they're examined for gunpowder residue. That group would be the police. The defendant is a former police officer. Shouldn't he know that you don't wash your hands right after a shooting death? if you could possibly be a suspect. And here, there were only two people who were up in the house, the defendant and the murder victim. Well, would it surprise you to learn that the police show up and they tell the defendant not to wash his hands. Right? They tell it. So even if he wasn't a cop, he would know, okay, the police have told me not to wash my hands. Would it surprise you that he went and washed his hands anyway? What was he washing off? You know, the idea of, hey, I was drunk, I was doing things I shouldn't have done, that only goes so far. You call 911, they show up, you have some story where you're in the next room, the cops say, player, don't wash your hands, and you go and wash your hands. Seems to me that a reasonable interpretation of that fact sequence is that the defendant was trying to thwart a police investigation. The defendant was trying to get rid of some possible gunshot residue on his hands. Keep in mind, you had gunshot residue on his shirt. Let's also talk about the bloody footprints. Now understand, there were multiple blood spatter experts at the trial. And they disagreed on some parts of the case. But the blood spatter experts, as well as medical experts, agreed that the fatal gunshot occurred while the victim was in the kitchen sitting down. And that after he gets shot, he slumps forward in his chair. Right? Both agreed that he's in the chair bleeding for his wound for some period of time, causing the blood to drain down. That's the blood pattern. Right? And, of course, to pool by the chair. Now, at some point, the victim then falls off the chair. Right? Where, as you can imagine, a larger pool of blood forms by his head and upper torso. Now, would it shock you? Think about the time sequence, right? He's in the chair, he's bleeding. Some blood forms. So we have an idea that he's in the chair for a little bit. Then his body falls out of the chair. Would it shock you that the defendant walked around the victim's blood after the shooting and left at least three bloody footprints 
at the scene. Folks, I don't know what can be said here. It seems to me that the 911 calling defendant was at the murder scene for a bit. That blood actually drained out of the victim and was on the floor. And the defendant, so much blood was there that the defendant was able to walk in the blood and leave footprints in the blood. Doesn't sound to me like the 911 call was made right away. Understand, too, there's blood spatter on the defendant's pajamas. Let me say, too, that the blood spatter on the pajamas and the corresponding void or absence of blood on the chair located directly next to the murder victim shows that defendant was sitting in the chair next to the murder victim when the murder victim was shot. Right? The blood spatter doesn't put the defendant in another room like he claimed to the police until evidence mounted. No, the blood spatter puts the defendant next to the murder victim at the time of the shooting. Let's go a little bit further. Now, according to the state's blood spatter expert, there was no high-impact blood spatter on the victim's hand that is found with the gun in it. If the victim used the gun, you would expect there to be high-impact blood spatter on the hand. Also, keep in mind, too, that because the victim is holding the gun, you would expect there to be a void on his hand where he held the gun. That wouldn't have blood on it because the gun's in the way. Well, understand, the blood evidence is inconsistent with that. There's no such void on the victim's hand, the hand that had the gun in it. In other words, the blood evidence makes it look like the gun was planted in his hand after he had already been shot. Keep in mind, his fingerprints on the gun are bloody fingerprints. So he's already bleeding when the gun's placed in his hand. Let me also say, too, that there's something called blood drain patterns. In other words, if you're holding a gun and you fire the gun and blood comes back and then it, you know, hits the gun and hits your hand and then drains off, you would think that you'd be able to look at the blood drain patterns and match them up to the hand and the gun. In other words, as the blood drains off the gun onto the guy's hand, you would expect to be able to follow the trail, to be able to point to where it drained off the gun and onto the guy's hand. That's if the guy was holding the gun at the time it was fired. Folks, here, the blood drain patterns don't match up. They, they simply don't. 
So, again, this is more powerful evidence that the gun was not in the victim's hand at the time the victim was shot. It was placed there afterwards. Who's the most likely person in the world to place the gun in the victim's hand after the shooting? I would argue it's the guy who was seated next to him at the time of the shooting. And that guy is the defendant. Let's also talk about the unusual nature of the alleged suicide. Now understand, people do shoot themselves from time to time. They do commit suicide using a gun, but it's usually in the side of the head or in the mouth. A very, very small amount of people, less than 1%, in fact, it's less than one half of 1%, less than 1 in 200, shoot themselves in the eye. Here, we're to believe that a victim with very little experience with guns assembles a gun and shoots himself in the eye. Understand, everyone concedes that the victim hated guns. He didn't know how to use a gun. Yet he's supposed to have assembled a gun and then decided to kill himself in an unusual manner. Understand, too, that he's supposed to have held the gun backwards and fired with his thumb. Someone who doesn't know how to use a gun, are you sure they wouldn't hold the gun and have a proper finger on the trigger? I would argue that putting your thumb on the trigger is an advanced move that someone who knew guns would do. Not a drunk guy with an aversion to guns who we don't even know how he would assemble the gun. Right? And of course, he's doing complicated moves by holding the gun in such a way where he uses his finger. And he's figuring out this grip, of course, with the defendant sitting right next to him. So, just think about this. If the jury were to buy into the idea of the suicide, and they didn't, they convicted the defendant, they would have to have believed that a guy who hated guns somehow found defendant's gun disassembled, right, taking it out of defendant's bag, assembled it, despite there being no evidence whatsoever that he had any knowledge of how to assemble a firearm, right, then he would have walked into the kitchen, sat down next to defendant, who has blood spatter on him, has gunshot powder residue on him, right? The murder victim would have had to have then sat down next to the defendant in the kitchen. And then decided to commit suicide by shooting himself in the eye with his thumb on the trigger. And that with all that awkwardness happening, not have the gun move in his hand because the thumbprint on the gun is pristine. It's not smudged. And of course, the jury would have to believe that the defendant didn't know what was going on. 
that the victim shoots himself to death, literally seated next to the defendant. And the defendant is disoriented. So much so that when the cops arrive, the defendant believes he was in another room when the shooting took place. Right, so much so that when the cops tell the defendant who himself is a former cop, player, don't wash your hands. The defendant, because he's drunk and struggling, goes and washes his hands by chance. And of course, by chance, the blood trails and the blood evidence don't match up in terms of the gun, how the blood drains off the gun, and the blood trails on the victim's hand. Folks, I'm not buying it. Understand only one jury has ruled on this case and they found the defendant guilty. The prosecution has decided not to retry the case because of the time that has elapsed since the motion for new trial was granted, went up on appeal, and then got reversed. Right? I believe the forensic evidence and just common sense support the jury's verdict. Right? There simply is no evidence, none whatsoever, that the victim knew how to assemble the gun. We're supposed to believe that the defendant is in the room with the victim and has no idea that the victim has found his gun. Where would the victim have assembled the gun? Wouldn't it have been right next to the defendant who we know lied to the police? Why doesn't the blood evidence match up? The whole story makes no sense whatsoever. And of course, defendant, a former cop, had to know he was violating police protocol by lying to the police, right? Walking around the murder scene, contaminating it, washing his hands so there's no gunpowder residue, but oh, he forgot to wash his shirt. Guess what? There's gunpowder residue on the shirt. Even his lawyer concedes now that he's sitting next to the victim at the time of the shooting. If he's sitting next to the victim at the time of the shooting and the forensic evidence doesn't support the idea that the victim committed suicide, given the bun powder residue on his shirt, doesn't the defendant look guilty to you? He does to me. Given that one jury found him guilty already. Why isn't the prosecution prepared to try to hold him accountable before another jury? That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I do hope you watch the Dateline. I get the feeling, you know, Keith Morrison wants to look fair and balanced. I get the feeling that he's hoodwinked here. He lets the defendant talk. And the defendant is talking about how he and his family suffered a lot of financial hardship as a result of being accused of this murder. And he tries to paint himself as a good guy. And we're supposed to believe some storyline that there was no tension at all between himself and the son-in-law who, of course, was feast or famine financially in terms of supporting the defendant's daughter-in-law. Right? The case just doesn't make sense. If, in fact, the defendant was passed out and seated next to the victim, and the victim went and 
got the gun, and then, you know, decided, of all the places to kill himself, let me do so right next to the gun owner. Let me do so in a way where all my prints on the gun are blood prints. Right? That show that the gun doesn't move in my hand. Right? If that happened, then what should have happened is the defendant, when the cops came, should have said, look, I was seated next to this guy. Uh, I came to, I may have heard a bang, I may not have. The guy was uh, shot. He later slumped out of the seat. He'd be able to give a set of facts different than what he did. There wouldn't be the cover-up that we're getting. Also, aren't you concerned? that the defendant disassembles his own gun, but yet there's none of his DNA on the gun. I think he's guilty. I believe this charismatic guy got away with murder. I encourage everyone to see his presentation on the latest edition of Dateline. His name's Robert Fisher. The victim's name was Lee Ratter. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.